feeling good, like I should. When in Durga, walk around the neighborhood, feeling blessed, never stressed. Got that sunshine on my Sunday bed. Good morning, Discovery Church. Uh, how we doing? Great to be with you. Those of you uh, at our Alafaya campus, those of you at Winter Garden, online, wherever you find yourself today, it is great to be with you. Excited uh, this weekend as we launch into a new series over the next six or seven weeks that we have simply entitled Living My Best Life. Living My Best Life. So let me ask you here in Alafaya Winter Garden, uh, when you think of this, when you hear this, is there a time in your life where you would say, I was, I was doing this, or I was with this person, or I was vacationing here, or I purchased this, and in that moment, I was living my best life? Maybe right now as you sit in this service listening to this teaching, you're saying, right now I'm living my best life. Thank you, Dad. Yeah, maybe you are, okay? And we know what it's like to have moments where we are living our best life. I mean, I can relate to this. Just a, a few weeks ago, June 10th, um, that day, I uh, married off our oldest daughter, Michaela, to her now husband, Greg. So this is, uh, this is, um, this is that ceremony, and I'm, thank you. And, you know, I'm trying to hold it together, and then we got, we got a picture coming up here, and I'm looking at Greg, and I'm saying to Greg, who's 6'5", if you screw this up, man, your best life is no more, all right? But in all seriousness, um, it was a tremendous day celebrating the union of, of two godly people who have sought to honor the Lord with their lives. And that, that day and that time of the joining of two families that we love dearly and we trust they love us as well, and we just celebrated the goodness of God. And the wedding reception was amazing. The parrots like to dance, all right? So we danced. I crowd surfed, okay? Uh, it was awesome. And in that time, I would say, I was living my best life. Not too soon after that, my, uh, we had to move Michaela to Annapolis there uh, near Maryland in Maryland because her husband, Greg, just graduated from the Naval Academy. So they're there and he's gonna go to Quantico here soon. And yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I had nothing to do with it. I had nothing to do with it. But uh, no, Greg's an amazing man and uh, will serve our country. And, um, but as I was talking to a friend here in the church, his name is Jeff, about this trip, I was saying, yeah, we got a mover, it's a long drive and gas prices. He says to me, well, why don't you take my Tesla? I said, come again? <laughs> he said, why don't you take my Tesla? I said, let me pray about it. Yes, okay, um, all right. And you know, I didn't want to rob, as a pastor, Jeff of his blessing to me. So I said, okay, I, I, will, I will drive your Tesla. And so I had heard about Teslas. I've seen Teslas. Some of you drive Teslas, and I have Tesla Envy. And um, so I got in this Tesla with my son, Jake, and uh, we left Sunday after church a couple weeks ago, and my family had already taken off, and we started driving this Tesla. And this Tesla is amazing. This thing is fast. At times, I could just take my hands off the wheel and it would drive itself. And we started on this amazing road trip listening to all the songs, all the bells and whistles, and we would stop along the way to charge it up. We got a picture of this. And we would just meet people. We don't even know these people, all right? And we're just talking to them about the Tesla. They wanted to see the Tesla. They wanted to sit in the Tesla. I'm like, come on, it's not mine, it's okay. And we're just, we're just taking this trip. And in this time, I'm experiencing my bestie in the Tessie. All right? <laughs> living my best life. We all know what it's like to have moments of living our best life. But see, the culture will tell us that our best life is found in worldly things. It's found in earthly things. And find your best life if you buy this. Or if you upgrade to this, or you try this, or, you, or you, you get with this person, or you go here, or you change to this, this will make you happy. In this, you will find your best life. And I'm not saying that all of this is bad. 
The wedding wasn't bad. The Tessie wasn't bad. But if we seek to only find our joy and excitement in that, in that temporary fulfillment, that's just what it is. It's temporary. And eventually, if we're honest, the best in life in time just becomes life. It becomes routine. It becomes mundane, it becomes familiar, it becomes boring. I enjoyed the Tesla, but I got tired of having to stop and charge it up. Because a trip that was supposed to take 13 took 17 hours. And after a while, just like everything in life, it's our best life in the moment, but then it becomes routine. So what happens? We look for something else to feel that void or to, to give us that, that sense of excitement and jubilation to, to give us our best life again, only to find ourselves again on the same cycle. Anyone else relate? So if this is true of our experience, is there truly a best life that doesn't become routine, that doesn't become mundane, that doesn't become boring, that doesn't become all too familiar or outdated? And I would say to you, yes, there is. But it's not found in the culture. It's found in the kingdom. And not just some ordinary kingdom or even the magic kingdom. It's found in God's kingdom. God's kingdom, the place where God is ruler over all things and where his will and his purposes are being accomplished Jesus, the Son of God who came to earth to give us life, declares this in John 10. I have come that they, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. And this word abundantly, as you research and do a word study, means to the full, till it overflows. I have come, Jesus in essence says, to give you the best life. So what is it God's kingdom and the idea of it has regarding the best life and, and how exactly do we find it? Well, to help us understand it and how to find it, we're going to be exploring over the coming weeks the book of 1 John. 1 John, which is found in the New Testament. It's the 23rd book, and I would encourage you to meet me there right now. 1 John chapter 1. First John, a little bit of context. Uh, most scholars will believe and agree that this is written by the Apostle John, one of the first 12 disciples of Jesus. What's interesting about John is John is the only disciple who's lived to the age he is at. Uh, it's believed he's somewhere in his 80s, writing this letter now to a, a group of churches, most likely in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. So John literally is an elder himself, but he's also figuratively an elder in the life of the church. John has helped to plant the churches and the faith communities of Jesus, much like here at Discovery Church. And he's writing to the churches because physically he can't go to them because of his age. But he's writing because he's concerned, because at this time there are many traveling evangelists or teachers, and some of them are providing false teaching to the churches. So what's happening as a result is people are falling away from the faith or they're adopting, if you will, a counterfeit faith and truth. So John, in an attempt to, to reach out to them and to speak to them, is writing a letter that he's hoping will circulate amongst the churches. But there's an absolute reason and purpose John is writing this letter and it's given to us in chapter five, which is the last chapter of this small book. He writes this. I write this to you, verse 13, so that you may know that you have eternal life. There's an assurance of salvation. He's hoping that the listeners, as they listen to this letter being read to them, they would come to more fully understand what is eternal life, how to find it, and how to live into this life. Because this life, which John will teach us, he believes is the best life. And this series is all about you and I understanding what the best life is, how we find it, and how we live into it. So you ready? Here we go. Come with me, 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And we're only going to look at really the first four verses of this letter. Here we go. John writes, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, 
which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. I want to ask you just to hang with me here for a few moments. This is going to get uh, a little theological here, but this is important to understand what John is doing here as it sets up the rest of the letter. In the opening verses of this letter, John is doing something that most New Testament writers do in their letters to the churches. What John is doing is he is presenting his Christology. He is simply presenting his theology regarding the divine nature and work of Jesus Christ. And this is critically important to understand because to understand the abundant life Jesus is referring to, we have to understand Jesus and his nature. So I wanna present to you a term that I'll use to describe Jesus, and it's this, the two-ness of Christ. The two-ness of Christ, and it simply means this, Jesus Christ is one person with two natures. Jesus Christ is one person with two natures. And these two natures are without confusion. They are without conflict, they are without change, they are without division or separation. So let's briefly look at these two natures. John starts, chapter one, verse one, he says, that which was from the beginning. Now he's referring here to Jesus. What's the beginning? The beginning of it all. The beginning even before creation, before Genesis one, the beginning of the beginning. Jesus is present at that time. And John writes about this in another book, the Gospel of John, in chapter one, verse one. Come there with me. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. With God, he's speaking of Jesus. He was with God in the beginning, Jesus was. Through him, through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him, in Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Now come with me to Colossians chapter one. The apostle Paul, start of his letter, he's doing the exact same thing, the Christology. He says, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, For in him, in Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him, through Jesus, and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So what's happening here? Well, both John and the Apostle Paul are identifying a part of Jesus' nature, and it's this, part one, Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully God. Jesus is one with God. God is a triune God. Maybe you've heard the term Trinity. You have the Father, you have the Spirit, which we'll look at in a minute, and you have the Son. God exists in three persons. This is important. Jesus is not born of God, but is from the substance of the Father. True God from true God, begotten, not made. Jesus is one with the Father. To help us better understand this trinity, uh, let me give you a math equation. Here we go. One plus one plus one equals one. The Father, the Spirit, and the Son, separate, but together, they're one. Okay, clear as mud, all right? Don can explain it when he gets back, okay? All right? (laughs) They exist as one. They exist in fellowship and relationship with one another, and this is important. Let's look at the second part. Jesus is fully God, the second part. John writes, which we have heard, 
Speaking of Jesus, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life, the life appeared, speaking of Jesus. What John is saying here is he's declaring that the author of all life and creation, who spoke the world into existence, who spoke you and I into existence, has now appeared through Christ, in Christ, amongst his creation. Jesus is the revealer. He is the communicator of God to all humanity. Jesus is the word. God spoke creation to existence, the word, through Christ. Jesus is the word incarnate. He is the word of God made flesh. He is the embodiment and the manifestation of all life. All life was created through Jesus. I know this is sounding redundant, but it's so important. This is key. John says that I and others have not only heard him, many people had heard God up to that point, but we saw him. And not only did we see him, and this would have been revolutionary, we touched him. We touched God. And he touched us. And this word touched goes beyond just a simple touch. It's, it means examined. We have examined. We have investigated. And listen, church, John is writing, believe me, what I tell you is true. I have seen God. I have encountered God. I have had close proximity and intimacy with the one true God. He is who he says he is. And in this, in these four verses, John is laying the foundation for Christ, one, as an eternal being, fully God, and secondly, as a historical, biological manifestation of God. Not only is Jesus fully God, but Jesus is fully man. Jesus is fully God, and Jesus is fully man. So when John refers to the word of life, all life was spoken and created through him. He is referring to the word made flesh, the good news of Jesus. So, if Jesus is the word made flesh and all things were created through him and he holds all things together and is the word of life, fully God, fully man, then our conclusion must be that all life is found in Jesus Christ. All life is found in Jesus Christ. And life without Christ, as simply as I can state it, is this, it's like a fish out of water. Life without Christ is like a fish out of water. Why? We were created by Christ to do life with God. Just like a fish was created to do life in water. We were not created to do life without God, just like a fish was not created to do life without water. But here's the truth of it. Some of you today are trying your best to do your life without God. You're trying to do your marriage without God. You're trying to manage your finances without God. You're trying to find a career or find a purpose for your life without God. You're trying to raise your children without God. You're trying to tend to the emotional depths of the, the darkness of your soul and trying to find healing, but you're doing it without God. And I'm 45 years old. I haven't lived an entire life yet, but I've lived a lot of life. I got four kids, I've seen a lot of life. I've been doing what I'm doing here a long time and I've come to this conclusion. Life without God does not work. Life without God does not work. And people try to do life without God and eventually they end up in my office. Life without God does not work. Why? Because life was not created to do life apart from God. We were created by God through Jesus to do life with Jesus. And can we just be real and honest? Life is hard. Amen? Life's hard. And without Jesus, I'll just be really honest, life is a sick joke. Because if this is all there is, turn on the news, if this is all there is and then we die, what a sick joke. 
I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. What I've experienced, and I know many of you are experiencing and have experienced in your life, without Jesus, life struggles to find meaning, it struggles to find purpose. But with Christ, not that life gets blissful and easy, but in it we find its meaning, we find its purpose. Why? Because life was intended to do with Christ. Jesus says this in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, if you do life with me and I with you, we do life together, you will bear much fruit. You will see the purposes and the abundance of life. For apart from me, you're like a fish out of water. You can do nothing. And you'll keep striving and striving and seeking. And some of you today are completely exhausted because you've tried to do life on your own. We weren't created to do life without Christ. Which is why exactly John is writing this letter and is why we are teaching this series. It's too important. It's critically important. So let's keep digging. John says, we have seen it and testified to it, speaking of Jesus, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We, we proclaim to you this eternal life, this Jesus has, has appeared to us and now this life is made available to you and to me, to all who want to receive it. So what is eternal life? John gives us the definition in his gospel. John chapter 17, he says this. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is knowing God. But see, knowing in scripture, the word knowing goes so much deeper than maybe our understanding of of what it means to know. It goes way beyond just knowing about something or having knowledge of something, although that is important. See, many people, including people within the sound of my voice, know about God. They know that God exists and that God created the world. They know about Jesus and that he came on Christmas and he gave his life on Good Friday and he rose from the dead on Easter. Many people know about the Bible. In fact, many people can quote scriptures. They can go right to them and when you talk to them, they can, they can, they can pull them out, which is important, but they know them. Many people know about prayer. Many people know many different worship songs. Many people know theology and can talk theology with the best of them. They know about church and they even attend church. We can know a lot of things about God and godliness. But notice that the scripture does not say eternal life is knowing about God. Eternal life is knowing God. Henry Blackaby writes this in his book, Experiencing God. God is not a concept or a doctrine. He is a person who seeks a close, one-on-one relationship with you and me. God does not want us to merely believe in him. He wants to relate to us on a personal level. He does not just want to hear us recite prayers. He wants to converse with us. God wants to be actively involved in our lives each day. So a word that I believe captures the fuller essence of this this word to know and something that we would understand more uh, clearly is the word experience. Experience. How do you and I really know something? We experience it. I knew something about Teslas, but when I experienced a Tesla, When I felt its torque and I sat in those seats and it drove itself and I could play any song I wanted and I put on the light show and it did this whole show and everything, you know what I'm talking about, some of you. I experienced a Tesla. I came into an intimate relationship with this Tessie. Before I just had knowledge of, I saw them. I knew how they worked. But it wasn't until I experienced it that I really, really understood it and appreciated it. See, John declares, I have seen Jesus. 
I have heard Jesus. I have touched him. He's saying, church, I have experienced God intimately. The apostle Paul, who had an experience and an encounter with Jesus, and he was overcome by his grace and his mercy and his love and the calling that Jesus put on his life, he pens these words in another letter, Philippians chapter three. Listen to what Paul says. Verse seven, but wherever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing of experiencing Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. I love this. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. What Paul is saying is you can have all the best Stuff of life, I consider them garbage. Give me Jesus. Because in him, I have found the best life. Psalm 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience God, taste him, savor who God is. God didn't create us just to have knowledge of him. He created us to experience him, to know him as we are known by him. What were we created for? To experience God. What aim should we set ourselves in life to experience God? What is the best thing in life, bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? Experiencing God. In Jeremiah 29, the Lord says, let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. What he's saying is, let not those who have earthly things boast about them because they're only going to fade away. They're only temporary anyway. He says, but, verse 24, let the one who boasts about this, that they have the understanding to know, to experience me. J.I. Packer writes in the book, Knowing God, what makes life worthwhile? I think young people need to listen to this. What makes life worthwhile is having a big enough objective, something which catches our imagination and lays hold of our allegiance. And And in this, the Christian has in a way that no other person has. For what higher, more exalted, and more compelling goal can there be than to know God. Eternal life, to know, to experience God. Having communion and fellowship with God as Jesus exists, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both now and for all eternity. And here's my core idea, because our best life is lived when we are experiencing God. Our best life is lived when we are experiencing God. So how do we experience God today? I mean, John, can we still see God? Can we still hear God? Can we still touch God or be touched by God? I mean, Jesus walked the earth 2,000 years ago. I hear what John is saying, but can that still happen today? And I would say to you, yes, it can. And to illustrate how that happens, I wanna bring you over here to this suitcase. And this suitcase is kind of weathered and, and tattered. This suitcase represents my life. And each one of us have a suitcase. Each one of us have a life that we're carrying around. And inside this suitcase, inside your life, you have things that make up your life. They describe and they define who you are and what your life is about. For example, uh, in this suitcase, I've got guitar strings because I love playing guitar and I love music and it's a part of my life. In this suitcase, I've got golf balls because I love playing golf. And golf is a big part of my my life. I enjoy golf. You want to play golf? Call me up. You're paying. All right, I love golf, all right? In my suitcase, I got a Bible. I know some of you are wondering, I hope he has a Bible in there. I've got a Bible in here, okay? Because the Bible, obviously, is something I build my life upon. In my suitcase, I've I've got Discovery Church hat because Discovery Church is a huge part of my life. I've been here almost 25 years. I love this place. It's family. This is my life. I've raised my kids here. 
In this suitcase, I've got a picture of my family. And I show it quickly because I can't get them all on here and I don't want anybody to feel left out, but my family's on here, okay? Because the family's a huge part of my life. In my suitcase, I got skinny jeans, okay? Because skinny jeans is part of my life, okay? All right? And all these things are, are important to me, okay? But the most important thing I have in my suitcase is a passport. And see, a passport, what does a passport do? A passport grants you access or passage to something that has been prohibited to you. And this passport metaphorically represents for me the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God that is given to me and given to every follower of Jesus as a gift. And the Spirit of God is the presence and power of God that comes and takes up residence within me and what it does is it gives me access and to the presence and power of God. And in this access, I'm able to experience God in a very intimate and personal way where I can see God, where I can hear God, where I can touch God, where I can be touched by God. And those of you who have a passport know exactly what I'm talking about. See, the Holy Spirit, it helps us. It leads us, it guides us. It comforts us, it corrects us, it protects us from ourselves. The Holy Spirit speaks God's truth to us. The Holy Spirit renews our spirit, renews our spirit, and it puts a seal on us, Scripture says, that says, I'm with God and he's with me. The Holy Spirit speaks to the deepest, darkest places of our lives and seeks to bring healing and wholeness. The Spirit gives us wisdom and gives us discernment, not earthly, but godly. The Spirit provides to us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So the first way we experience God is this, we receive and we recognize the gift of his Spirit. Do you have a passport? It's one thing to receive it, it's another thing to recognize this amazing gift that's given to us through Jesus. So that God's presence can go with us just like Jesus walked with John, Jesus wants to walk with us through the presence and the gift of his Spirit. And through this, as I said, we can hear, we can see, we can touch. So what does it look like to be touched by God? You ever felt God's grace pour over you? To the place where it brings you to a place of just awestruck? It was Easter time and we were meeting as a staff and uh, I wanted to talk about grace and I said this to the staff who were obviously pastors, followers of Jesus, I said this about grace. We know about grace, but we know about grace. We know about grace in this amazing unmerited favor, but we know about grace. We've heard it over and over and over again. We've taught it over and over and over again. And may we never become all too familiar with this amazing grace. So what happened is I, I asked the staff to think about a time in their life where they were overcome by God's grace and to stand and to share with the rest of us. And I kid you not, as each person stood and shared, they were overcome with emotion. And everyone listening became overcome with emotion. And in that moment, I believe we were touched by God. When's the last time you've been touched by God? When's the last time you were overcome with his grace, with his love, with his mercy, with his joy, with his peace? where you would recognize in this moment I'm being touched by God. In my own story this week, I, I said, Lord, I need you. I need to experience you. And I got in my car and I turned on this song, Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. And, and the Lord began to touch me. And I felt his peace and I felt his pleasure as his spirit swelled within me. The presence and the power of God. Why? Because I have a passport into his presence. So the first way we experience is to receive and to recognize. The last way is to live desperate for his presence. Live desperate for his presence. 
Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart, when you pursue me with all that you have. When is the last time you've been desperate for God? We get desperate for God when life gets hard, but I don't think God wants it just in those times. I think each and every day God wants us to experience him because experiencing God through the presence of his spirit is where the action is. And God would love nothing more than for you and I to wake each day going, Lord, I'm desperate for you today to experience you in a fresh and new way. Can you imagine what your life would look like if you, at the end of the day, put your head on your pillow and you said, I heard God, I saw God, and I was touched by God today? It changed your life. And this is what God desires for us. And he went to great lengths through his son and the gift of, the, of his spirit so that we could experience him are you desperate for his presence? I've shared with you a few times uh, prayers I believe the Lord answers regularly, and I'll, I'll give you another one here. The Lord has always answered this for me, and maybe this is a prayer that you pray later today or this week. Lord, reveal yourself to me in a fresh and new way. I wanna experience you. Lord, reveal yourself to me. When I pray with people at the altar, many times I will pray, Lord, reveal yourself to them in a way that is so tangible, so real, that they would experience you in a fresh and new way. And maybe that's a radical prayer that you need to begin to pray and trust that the Lord will reveal himself to you so that you can experience him and all that he has for you. In 1995, Andy Park a worship pastor wrote these lyrics. Some of you will remember this song. He said, I wanna know you. I wanna hear your voice. I wanna know you more. I wanna touch you. I wanna see your face. I wanna know you more. I'm reaching for the highest goal that I might receive the prize, pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside out of my way because I wanna know you more. When's the last time you've been desperate for God? When's the last time that you recognized the gift of his spirit within you where you've experienced God in a real way? I wanna encourage you to experience God in a fresh and new way in his word and fellowship with others and serving you can experience God and sitting with God in, in stillness and silence and saying, Lord, reveal yourself to me in a way that is so tangible. I wanna experience you. You can experience God in his creation, in his nature. I know many of you find God and experience him in creation. And when you experience him, let me encourage you to just record those experiences to encourage you when you feel distant from God. Record these God sightings, these God experiences. Lastly, the last two verses, John writes, we proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Rewrite this to make our joy complete. What John is saying is, we have found the best life, and it is found in Christ, and we have found this joy that this life brings, but we don't want any of you, and I would say Discovery Church is church pastors, we don't want any of you on the outside looking in. I have found the best life, and that life is found in Christ. It doesn't mean that life is all roses. But I found the presence and power of God, and what it means to tap into that is I make my way through life. And what John is saying, just like anyone else who experiences something great, I want everyone else, I wanted everyone to drive the Tesla. Because I experienced something so awesome. And what John is saying is our joy is made complete when you understand this life that Jesus has come to give you and come into the fellowship with us. And church family, as pastors and as leaders of the church, our joy is made complete as you understand the life that Jesus came to die, to give to you so that you can experience the best life and all that he has so you can come into the fellowship with the Father and with the church, and in that, our joy, our joy is made complete. So as I close, I wanna to speak to two groups of listeners. First, I wanna to speak to the believers, those who would say, I have a relationship with Jesus. 
And I'll ask you this question. Have you experienced God lately? You know about grace. What you know about grace? Have you experienced God lately? The ultimate reason, as I read earlier, that John wrote this book is so that you may know that you have eternal life, that you have life in Christ. And I would contend then that experiencing God is the evidence that in fact we have an authentic relationship with Jesus. And if you say, I know about Christ and I know about all this, but you can't give any evidence to the experience you've had with God, then I would question. Because God created us and brought us into relationship to experience him. And that experience is the evidence. God created us to know him. This may be a little on the nose, but I'll say it. We can have life in church, but not life in Christ. Many people go to church. We're going to church, it's Sunday. And I got life in the church, but it doesn't mean you have life in Christ. God did not give his life for a building. God gave his life for you and for I that we could experience him and in that find the best life. When is the last time you experienced God? Seek him, get in his word, fellowship with other believers, spend time worshiping him, sit with him. Maybe this summer is the summer that changes your life as you experience God. Maybe the summer of 2022 will be the summer I experienced God. If you're looking for a great resource, read Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. It's an oldie but a goodie, and it will guide you deeper into these waters that we've talked about. The second group of listeners or anyone today within the sound of my voice here at Alafaya Winter Garden online that may be seeking and have yet to surrender their life to Christ. And I want to extend to you an invitation, an opportunity to enter into his presence, to to add, if you will, a passport to your suitcase. With Christ, God says, I want you to experience me. I want to give you life, and I want to give you life abundantly. I created you for a purpose, and I have a plan for your life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father. No one enters into the presence of God except through me. God wants you to experience him in all that he has for you. And it's by no accident that he's drawn you here today to hear of this invitation. So if that's you, I wanna encourage you to do something. I wanna encourage you to pray with me if you feel led in this moment. I wanna lead you through a prayer and it's on the back of your note sheet, but we kind of have a condensed version I'll lead you through. And I'd ask everyone just to close their eyes just out of respect for the room here at Alafaya Winter Garden. And maybe you're here today and you have a relationship with Jesus, but you said, you know what? God, I haven't experienced you in a long time, so I I wanna place a new stake in the ground today. I wanna be desperate for your presence. I wanna seek you and I wanna find you in ways that are so real and so tangible. And I wanna live into a more abundant life that your son came to give. If you're here today and you wanna pray that prayer for the first time to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, just repeat these words. Lord Jesus, I admit to you that I'm a sinner. I admit to you that I have lived life like a fish out of water. And I ask you to forgive me. To come and to wipe the slate clean. And I trust in your forgiveness and I accept you as my Savior and as my Lord. And in this moment, I believe and I receive the gift of your Spirit to come and make its housing within my life. And I acknowledge you as the Lord of my life. And I believe with all my heart in this moment, if you just prayed that, in the sincerity of your heart, in this moment, God has granted you a passport And the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead now has come and taken up residence inside of you so that you could experience all that God has for you as you live into the best that he came to bring. 
because our best life is lived when we are experiencing God.